Welcome, and thank you so much for coming this afternoon. Uh, my name is Ann Thrupp, and I'm here, I'm the executive director of the Berkeley Food Institute, and I'm here to welcome you just to kick off this, this event. And um, to, to begin, before we start the panel, um, we're so pleased and honored to have a group from the Lideres Campesinas um, who are going to do a teatro, a theater event for you. For, and I want to introduce uh, Suget Lopez, who will introduce the group. And we'll have this to begin our panel. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Suguel Lopez. I'm Lides Campesinas Executive Director. And um, here today, uh, there's, it's a group of 16 of us. Uh, who will be performing our theory skit. But before that, I just would like to share very, very quickly that uh, Lideres Campesinas is the only statewide network of farm worker women and girls in California. Our movement began uh, in the late 80s, and um, this year we're celebrating 20 years of our, since our incorporation. And uh, our mission is to strengthen the leadership of farm worker women so that together we can be the agents of social, economic, and political change to ensure our human rights. And thank you so much for, for being here with us today, and welcome to our um, theater group. Okay. Hurry up, hurry up, we're gonna start. Hi, how are how you doing? How are you doing? Uh, long time I had not seen you. What did you bring me today? So I'm bringing you this new one. Is she like Yeah, like she's them? just like the way you like her. Uh, here, I, I leave her with you. Teach her how to work. So you're going to stay here with the foreman. He's going to teach you what you're going to be doing. And I'll bring you more later. You're going you're gonna to stay with me. And then I'm going to take you to my house. Start working here. Let's look at how everybody else is working. Just follow. Move, move, girls, move. I'm sorry, but I'm thirsty. Where can I find the water? Water hasn't arrived. You have to wait. Tomorrow you bring your bottle of water because it, here it comes late. Hey, foreman, I really need to use the restroom. The, the restrooms are not here. We took them. I really to have clean. to go. They're bringing, they're, they're, they're going to bring him later. So again, they, they stole 20 hours from our check. This is not fair. This has to stop. Hey, stop talking. Hey, move, move. Hey, move your hands. Move like you moved last night. Two, three hours have passed since they began work that day. It's getting warm, close to 90 degrees. It's really, really warm here. We need the shade. Hey, I'm going to have someone to put the shade. They haven't brought it yet. I really, I'm really feeling bad, sick. The, this is, it's just too warm. I'm feeling some. You must be, some you pain. must be, you must be pregnant. Take her to the, to the auto. Move, move. How are you doing? I, I'm not feeling well. Seems like these plants have something. I, can, I see something and, and I can smell something funny here. I'm not feeling well. I'm really not feeling well. Help me. Hey, hey, let's leave. Go, go home. You come tomorrow. There's a lot of pesticides here. Hey, go home, leave. We want you early in the morning. I don't morning. feel well. Thank you, thank you, Lideres Campesinas. 
Uh, my name is Maria Chaveste, and um, I want to welcome you all. And uh, let me just say, as someone who grew up in the fields, even that little scene brought back a lot of memories. Um, so what we're going to discuss today uh, is with our wonderful guest, as I pull up my notes here, um, is to really have a discussion about um, today in 2017, spring 2017, uh, farm workers in the age of Trump. There are many issues that uh, present themselves, many questions, and we have four uh, wonderful people with us who have different perspectives on some of the issues that you just saw a tiny bit. Um, let me um, first uh, eat, describe how this uh, panel is going to uh, work. Each of the panelists will have five minutes to discuss their work as it pertains to the themes. I'm not going to read their bios. You have it in the program. Um, we are... Uh, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. There are cards. We want you to uh, feel free to ask questions, and we'll collect them. And we really want this to be an interactive, not just folks talking to you. Yeah, let me just pull up. That is the problem with depending on. There. So before we start, I want to set the context for uh, the issue of farm works. Um, agriculture is a very important uh, issue, obviously, because we all have to eat. And in the state of California, it is a major industry. And one of the things, that, as um, Anthrop, our executive director at the Berkeley Food Institute, it is an interdisciplinary um, center focused on trying to transform our food system to one that is sustainable, just, and equitable. And one of the issues that is involved towards that work is the issue of workers, farm workers, but also all along what is known as the food, uh, the food chain. And in this country, we have two to three million ag workers, about 800,000 in the state of California alone. Uh, the estimates are that 70% um, at least, if not more, of the farm workers throughout the country are undocumented. I want you to keep that fact in the back of your head as we discuss and as you uh, listen to the discussions both in the state and across the country on the issues Im of immigration, which has been very present uh, over the last few years. So we depend, uh, especially for fruits and vegetables, on an undocumented workforce to provide us what we eat every day across the country. California feeds not just this state, not just this country, but worldwide. 70% of farm workers do not have health insurance. Uh, a lot of it related to being undocumented and therefore not eligible for the Affordable Care Act, or Medi-Cal, or any of those programs. Almost 30% live below the poverty line in the United States, right? One third of the workers who bring you your food live below the poverty line. In fact, a significant percentage uh, suffer from food insecurity themselves. The average income is uh, between 10 to 13,000 a year. It is also agriculture, one of the most dangerous occupations in the country. Farm, farm workers and those working on farms are nearly twice as likely to die on the job as police officers, five times as likely to die as firefighters. So we have a, a workforce that is, uh, as you saw, challenged by language differences, Literacy challenges, education, discrimination, um, the peace rate, whether it's strawberries or a variety of other um, crops, and immigration status. So against that backdrop, one of the things we want to explore is how do we, in uh, a very polarized 
uh, country actually try to devise solutions to the challenges of having a workforce. Uh, there was an article, I think, within the last couple of weeks about the wine growers. I, this is Berkeley, after all. I'm sure many of you enjoy a glass of wine. The wineries up in Northern California are very worried about their workforce. You need a workforce to be able to pick those grapes at a particular time, at the appropriate time, as, as the winemakers decide. And the fact that there are so many people afraid to uh, look for work, to be out, to be out in public, because of the increased immigration uh, enforcement that we've experienced over the last uh, three months and beyond. So these are very difficult, complex issues. And what we hope to have is a thoughtful discussion about what people are doing at the state, at the local level, from advocates, from business, from academics. So with that, let me please ask our panelists to come up. Um, as I said, Luis Alejo uh, is our supervisor in Salinas County. Is it Salinas County? Salinas, city Salinas. Monterey. City, Monterey County, I can remember. Uh, former member of the state legislature. Um, and he will be talking about uh, some of the work that they're doing at the, at the county. And uh, he was a former mayor as well. Uh, Millie Trevino Saucedo. Sauceda, perdóname, perdóname. Um, we'll be talking about, as one of the original leaders and founders of Líderes Campesinas, we'll be talking about uh, some of the issues that women face and what they are doing uh, in terms of their advocacy. Then we will have uh, Chad Sokol, who's Costco's social, um, social audits and will bring a buyer's perspective on working with farmers um, and uh, middle um, vendors along the, the chain. And last, we will have Christy Gatz, who will bring a, a macro perspective on the increased role of market-based incentive programs um, over the last 10 years. So with that, I'm going to first remind everyone we have five minutes each. I know that there's, that's way too short for all the things that we need to discuss. But we do want to give it, uh, ample time for everyone to be able to ask some questions. So we'll start with Luis. Please. All right. And well, please, can we welcome up? Thank you, everybody. Else. Well, first of all, I want to thank Maria, the Food Institute here at UC Berkeley, and really want to thank Líderes Campesinas because they're one of the model organizations uh, doing great work uh, informing uh, our community on a lot of health issues, safety issues, and really uh, some amazing women of all the organizations. Many of them who came from my area, the beautiful Salinas Valley, they drove from Greenfield, Soledad, Salinas, and some I heard came from Madera and Sonoma. So I really thank them for coming from so far. But as they said, yeah, thank you for coming. Um, but like, as I said, I'm a former state assembly member, just finished my term now, serving as a Monterey County supervisor. But this is a very timely topic, as we all know. Every day, it seems we go back and see the news. It's sometimes unbelievable, some of the things you hear and the actions being done by our federal administration. But tomorrow, on this topic of sanctuary cities and protecting immigrant rights, the Santa Clara and San Francisco uh, counties have... Um, uh, lawsuits before the federal court in San Francisco at 9 in the morning, and they're trying to seek a, 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 a preliminary injunction to put a halt to Trump's order to defund sanctuary cities and counties across the state of California and across the country as well. So this is a very timely topic. Um, I'm very proud to be serving as a Monterey County Supervisor now because I represent the beautiful Salinas Valley. In my area alone, we have the salad bowl of the world, the garlic capital, the artichoke capital, the strawberry capital of the world. And with that come thousands and thousands of workers, um, men and women, who really harvest the crops out in the fields or they're in the packing sheds. Um, um, processing the foods as well. So I represent a very beautiful area, but uh, also a working class community of so many different farm workers. This is the same area that John Steinbeck wrote about many decades ago about the plight of workers in California. But that's the same, those same stories are very true even till today. And um, for me, it's very timely having this conversation because when I first came to UC Berkeley, I was 19 years old back in 1994. I transferred from a community college and what we were fighting then was 
the topic of the day as well, it was the voters were pushing, well, Governor P. Wilson was pushing for Prop 187. It was one of the most draconian anti-immigrant propositions in the history of California. The voters approved it by 60%. And thank God, again, to our federal courts in the Ninth Circuit that they put a halt to that. They struck it down as unconstitutional. But again, here we are many years later, but now it's a fight with the new president and the, and the federal administration. But I wanted to come here to put it in context that so much has changed in California from 1994 to where we are today because those young people who were out protesting here in the streets of Berkeley and the communities back home like in Watson and Salinas, we later became the legislators, the leaders of the California legislature, and now we were passing some of the most pro-immigrant right, pro-farm worker rights legislation in the country, more so than any other state. They were happening, they've happened in the last five to six years here in California. And I just wanted to mention a few. For the first time out of any state in the country, we passed the right for farm workers to have overtime. The first time ever after eight hours, they will have the same rights as every other workers. We passed the first heat regulation so that the, the skit showed that the people who were suffering and dying out in the fields, including young women, like in Stockton in 2008, we put those new regulations to help protect our workers working out in these uh, very um, hot and dangerous conditions. But we've also raised the minimum wage. I was the author of raising it from eight to $10 an hour, the highest at that time back in 2013, and now the legislature has raised it to 15, the record amount uh, of, of minimum wage in the history of our country as well. It's happening here in California. But I also wanted to talk about another law that I authored in 2013, that was AB 60, where California allowed the opportunity for immigrants and farm workers to be able to pass all the traditional requirements, just like everyone else, to obtain a California driver's license. And after two years and two months now that the law went into effect, 850,000 immigrants, not just Latinos, but immigrants from all parts of the world that call California their home, they're able to drive to work, take their kids to school in the morning, go see the doctor, go buy groceries without fear that they're gonna get pulled over and have their car impounded. And so uh, last week, there was a, a, a university study that just came out that showed that it's reducing uh, accidents, uh, hit and run accidents. It's improved uh, traffic safety for everyone on California's roads and highways. It's uh, um, Dave Jones, a state insurance commissioner, has said that we have a dramatic rise in people obtaining auto insurance. Uh, so we have coverage if they're ever in an accident as a result of this law. And certainly for the lives of many immigrants, now they have a better life here in California as a result of that. So I call that the California success story, where if you pass policies that help integrate immigrants and farm workers, they're able to pay their taxes, have a better life, have a better standard of living, and we all win as Californians in this wonderful state. But there's still a lot of work to do. And I just wanted to talk about some work that, that's still before us and that we should all watch. Certainly SB 54, Senate Bill 54 is the bill that would make California a sanctuary county so that we put limits in the cooperation between local law enforcement and ICE in local communities. That's gonna be, be the first of its kind law that's be currently being uh, fought in Sacramento. Um, but we also have some work around farm worker housing, farm, farm worker health care. And I'm proud that counties like San Francisco, Santa Clara, most recently Monterey County, we decided to spend another $2 million to extend health care to farm workers and other immigrants that can't qualify, as was stated er earlier, by Covered California and other health care programs. So there, there is commitment at the local level, at the state level, to counter the policies that are coming from our federal government, but it's in these forums and communities across California that help local elected officials to stand up and do what is right to take care of our most vulnerable, our poorest residents. And when we do that as policymakers, we not only lift those families up, we lift up everyone else in the state of California as well. You take care of the least among us, you take care of everyone else in this wonderful state, this golden state um, we call home. So with that, I'll pass it on to the other speakers and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Luis. Meli, if you can give us a perspective from Lideres Campesinas. Yes, gracias. Uh, to start with, I, I, I do want to um, thank the Food Institute, uh, thank our madrina. She's always been there for us. Uh, Maria Chavez, you know, ever since we, we started doing our work statewide, um, she's been there and she's always questioning, ¿Qué más? What else are you doing? And that's good, that uh, gives us wake up calls. Um, I'm sorry I can't talk as fast as Louise, but um, I'm gonna try my best um, because we're only given five minutes and, and English is my second language. I know it's yours too, but uh, um, nonetheless. Um, um, in, in terms of talking about Lideres Campesinas, Lideres, it's a farm worker women's movement. 
It's not just, okay, we formed an organization and we're trying to learn and distribute information. To the contrary, what, uh, aside from doing that, we're trying to make sure we open dialogue so people in the community um, uh, also feel that they can do change themselves. And that's how we started. Uh, we didn't start uh, thinking that, oh, what is it out there that we're gonna, we're gonna uh, try to see if we can get the, the kind of support. To, to the contrary, we started doing a needs assess assessment. And that needs assessment was done for a, a master thesis, and that thesis was uh, to find out the, the needs of pharmacal women. And this is in the Coachella Valley. We didn't know that that thesis was gonna help us launch what became a movement. And many, many of our members uh, worked directly with, uh, way before, with the United Farm Workers. And we learned to organize already. We knew how to, uh, about, uh, to talk about some of the conditions, but um, what we knew is that there were a lot of issues that, about women that were not talked about. And um, when we started thinking about um, organizing and, and saying, okay, we need to um, uh, develop uh, programs that are gonna help uh, housing um, or uh, uh, make sure that people know more about uh, the minimum wage. And, and, but then we started thinking, in what way is it that we're gonna push ourselves for things to change? Um, it was not an easy task, and we didn't know we, we were gonna build a movement. We just knew that we needed to, to create some change. The needs assessment was, was done with women that were willing to, to share their issues, their problems. And it wasn't easy for, for women to just open up and say, oh yeah, I wanna be interviewed. It, it, was, it was pretty hard, but some of us were well known in that community, and it was, it was much easier for us to do that. Um, what came about with that assessment is that the interviewers uh, were, were, were finding out, and I was one of them, we were finding out that the women didn't wanna just share the, what were their issues. They didn't wanna just share that uh, they were complaining or, or uh, about uh, issues is that they, they wanted to be informed and find out how they could make better decisions. If they were better informed, they, they could make better decisions. And then we started find out, finding out that as a group, we could do change. And that, in, that, in that sense, it, was much, it, it became easier for us to start talking about our issues. Um, um, some, of, some of the things that we started learning is that, yes, there's, there's politicians that um, uh, knew that, um, that there needed to be changed, but they, they didn't know how to approach, I'm not talking about you, Luis, but <laughs> how to approach uh, our community. But uh, we started helping them open, open their minds about, um, uh, what is it, the reality of our community, okay? So there's, there's a lot to talk about um, what became with this, this kind of movement. Um, it's women that live and work, as Maria was talking about, earning right now 10 to 13,000. When we started, it was like between five to 6,000 a year. And what we wanted to do is, we don't, we don't want to continue living in this kind of situation, in this kind of condition. Uh, the more immigrants would come to this country, the less information there was for them, the less trust. Um, the more they would watch the media, the more they would become afraid. And in this area, it's even worse. But now the women are, what we have learned, not only through the theater and many other means, we have learned that by building the trust with our community and understanding that they have the power to change, to do the change themselves, it, it makes a lot more difference. Um, uh, there's, there's so much, the women in, in the, all these areas that uh, Suged was talking about in, in 11 different regions around California, um, they meet, 
they become they they become agents of change. It's not and, and they don't say that. It's um, uh, they just know that there are things that are wrong, and they get together and they make and they make decisions. They plan and they say this is what we want to do. But at the same time, it, it, when it's a movement, it's not just about oh uh, we're going to decide for others. We go out there in the community and we also try to find out what is going on so that we can, we can make sure that um, whatever we are responding to, it's really true to, to, to the community so that we can engage the people from, from the, that same community that we were, where we want to do the change. So I know my time is up um, <laughs> and you might have some questions later. Um, uh, but we're going to be here, and uh, as as you saw, the many the many people, the many of the women that were here, um, they come from different parts of the state, and they're more than willing to respond to you. It's not, it's not only me. Um, I'm only I'm only here because the women said, you know English, you can talk, so then you speak for us for for now. But the the the, the rest are are, are going to be willing to to speak to you too. Aplaudan, por favor. So I, I want to make sure we, we have, from Luis, a perspective on, on sort of lawmaking, legislative at both the state and at, and at the county and city level. From Millie, we have a perspective from the grassroots, from the advocacy, from people in the communities. So now we're turning to Chad. Um, to discuss from the business perspective how he sees these issues as, as a pro procurement and uh, a buyer, how, how have you approached these issues? How is Costco approaching these issues? Uh, thank you for having me. So um, I'll try to keep this brief as well. Um, I guess I'll probably start just to give very, very quick background on Costco Wholesale. I don't know how many people have shopped at a Costco or are familiar, but um, we're the world's largest wholesale club membership warehouse business. Uh, with sales of about $120 billion last year. Uh, we operate in about nine countries worldwide. Um, and so obviously because of that, we purchase a lot of goods. And most of that produce and, and goods that we're purchasing comes from the farm level, of course. Um, <laughs> So uh, my role specifically, I'm a buyer and I'm based out of the Bay Area and I, am dr I purchase dry grocery commodity items um, for all the Costco's in Northern California and for Northern Nevada. And that, for us as a company, um, all, all of the buyers that, that are part of Costco, we've all, um, most of us have been with the company a very long time. I've been there about 23 years total um, working. And so over that time, and I was speaking with Maria a little bit, that we have, uh, I think, really evolved our perspective and, and our role as buyers and what we're doing as a company from the early days. I think early on, very few of us were really that educated on what was going on beyond the finished goods that we were buying. So as our roles of buyers have really evolved quite a bit. And as a company, part of our mission statement, beyond just obeying the law and taking care of our own members and taking care of our employees, um, we've worked really hard internally to you know, have good wages, have good benefits, and we really think that that should be extended um, along our supply chain. So the people we're purchasing from and buying from um, we set very high standards on what they're doing. And initially, that's really kind of focused on food safety. I mean, I think as a retailer, as a buyer myself, that's probably the single most important thing that we look at is, is the quality and the safety of food coming in and obviously the people buying it and our customers and members. We want to make sure that food safety is absolutely of prime importance. But along with that, so initially in the early days, um, and I think it's interesting for us and even other retailers too, is we probably don't uh, speak a lot with the public about what kind of happens behind the scenes. So I think people just don't know what we're doing behind the scenes. And uh, in terms of food safety, we started implementing our own third party food safety audit uh, schematics and uh, with everybody that we're purchasing food from. And we began that internally many, many years ago. And since then, those standards have evolved and gotten better over time. And in addition to just a food safety aspect, we also uh, look at social audits. And social audits for us, we have now an internal division that is strictly solely devoted to looking at worker rights, worker safety, worker protocols, you know, pay, overtime pay, as, as many of those aspects as we can. So everybody that we're buying from, we require both these types of audits. Um, and I think Costco is in a little bit of a unique position because we 
sell uh, a few number of items. So in an average Costco, there's only about 4,000 total items, and that's food, non-foods, tires, everything. You go to a grocery store, there's 35, 40,000 items on the shelves. So for me as a buyer, um, the categories that I purchase, um, I work with coffee, I do flour, sugar, um, grains, rice, pasta. We're at a lot of different things, but within that, um, I have the choice to be very selective in who I'm buying product from. And I think that gives us an advantage, it gives me an advantage personally, to work with companies and work with growers and suppliers who share the same values that we do. Um, and because of that, I can be selective. I don't have to just go out and buy the, the cheapest thing on the market. I'm really looking for people who are quality uh, first and who are holding and setting very high standards. Um, and because of that, um, I think the other thing that we're doing internally is looking to become better educated all the time as buyers and as a company to uh, take care of the people that we're purchasing from. And over the last few years, um, even locally, Bay Area, Costco, we've worked with Ann uh, at the Berkeley Food Institute, and uh, we've kind of reached out to get uh, some uh, professors here to come to our offices, give better education for us, because one of the things that we've kind of come across over the last maybe 10 years is really the growth of organics. and. USDA certified organic uh, items. And that was something maybe 20 years, obviously 20 years ago, there really wasn't that much organic going on in the marketplace. But over the last few years, Costco Wholesale has become the number one uh, retailer of organic food in the United States. And um, we do that a couple different ways. And I think one of the ways that we do, uh, I guess I probably go back a little bit and just our overall business model is to be very, very efficient. If you've ever been to a Costco, I mean, there's not a lot of fancy things going on. It's pallets, it's full cases, and our whole business model is to make everything as efficient as we can so that we can pass on savings to customers. And because of that, um, organics is a great way for us to provide a very, very low cost to our customers and our members at a great value that maybe they can't afford to go buy organic produce or organic items at another retailer or at a co-op or something. And so as we've been able to offer those items at lower cost, um, the growth of organics is something that we feel very proud about. And I think um, in terms of myself, I tour and I audit a lot of facilities. I travel farms. I spend most of my time um, uh, working here locally, but I also travel abroad and I work internationally with farmers and processors um, all over the world. And uh, one of the things that we look for is as we're growing our organic food supply is a benefit to those workers, obviously working in fields with less pesticide use and things like that. Um, and that's very important to us and important to me as a buyer is to figure out ways to constantly make those relationships better and stronger. Um, and uh, this last year, I've also began uh, sitting in on the COPAC board, which is the Organic Product Advisory Committee of California. We work with the Department of Agriculture advising on um, organic policy for the state of California. Um, and I guess I would probably, the, the other thing I was asked to kind of mention is uh, Costco, our involvement with EFI, which is the Equitable Food Initiative. Um, EFI goes out and uh, primarily in California and Mexico certifying and working with farmers uh, in, in produce specifically and one of the things that EFI is doing and I think with Costco we're one of our um, uh, one of my associates at our corporate level is on the board of EFI, and one of the things EFI is doing is working with farmers directly. Um, the farmers who are part of EFI and who are certified that we're purchasing from, uh, those farm workers get paid a premium, and we pay that ourselves. That comes out of our pockets, and we don't pass those costs on to our customers and on to our members. And that's something I think we feel pretty pretty good about. Um, however, EFI is very, very small, and the number of farms they certify is fairly small, so they don't supply a ton of product for us. I think that's a standard that we would like to see to continue to grow and to get bigger, and I, I think it will over time. Um, but that's something that we've been working with, and, and you know, one of the things I think I would stress about Costco and one of our concerns is because we don't have to, um, we don't have so many items in the store, I can really focus in and hone in on the suppliers that are upholding the standards that we want to support. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the, the biggest thing, that, like I said, buying food that's safe and food safety, you know, as a customer buying food, I mean, that's my biggest thing. Um, is to be scared of people you know, getting sick from something they bought at Costco. So uh, I don't think you can have food safety without having um, uh, workers who care about what they're doing. So we see that along the supply chain as well. So um, I think my time is up. So uh, I'm going to stop there. So thank you. Thank you, Chad. Well, Chad's, uh, 
comments in the last couple of minutes um, relating to EFI. That's a perfect segue to, to Professor Christie gets on the the macro issues of, of uh, not just EFI, but how how you make a business case for treating your workers right. Um, so let me hand it off to Christy. Yeah, thank you so much, Maria. And thanks to the BFI for prioritizing this topic. And it's um, one of the, their priorities in terms of the research they've been funding. They funded some research I've done with colleagues who are here in the audience. I see Ron Strolik back there. Hi, Ron. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about market-based initiatives, but also a little bit more broadly about some of the work I've been doing over the last 10 to 15 years on this issue. And sort of briefly discuss how I, as a cooperative extension specialist, interface with farm labor issues, and how both critical and applied social science research can sort of help us in our collective quest to better understand and improve farm living and working conditions in California and in elsewhere. Um, so first of all, from a sort of critical social science perspective, my work has engaged in macro level and historical analyses of the efficacy of various different kinds of approaches to improving farm working conditions. And as Maria mentioned, a lot of those approaches are reflected here on the panel with Supervisor Alejo talking about the role of the public sector and regulation, with Millie talking about the importance of grassroots mobilization and movements, um, with Chad talking about the role of market actors and market-based initiatives like the EFI. There are other approaches that aren't represented on the panel, um, farm, farm worker unions, for example, as well as um, worker-based human rights organizations like the um, Coalition for Immokalee-Based Workers. Um, so my research has really focused on illuminating the political economic context in which all of these different approaches that, that actually constrain or facilitate the ability of these approaches to be successful in improving farm worker working and living conditions. So some of the questions colleagues and I have explored include sort of what are the effects of structural shifts in agriculture over time on farm workers and farm worker communities, um, such as um, consolidation of the agri-food system, globalization, growth in the organic sector, which Chad mentioned, the decline of the farm worker movement, um, as well as sort of increasing under-enforcement of farm worker regulations within a sort of more punitive immigration climate. Other questions um, include sort of my, some of my more recent work. What is the potential for market-based initiatives to ensure meaningful social and environmental sustainability in agriculture? What are strengths and weaknesses of various certification initiatives and the various labels that you see in the store? And then also another um, set of questions I've explored with my colleagues is sort of um, what have been the points of synergy and tension between, for example, the farm labor movement and the sustainable agriculture movement? And how have those two movements intersected at various points in time around, for example, certain legislative, legislative moments like um, attempts to ban hand weeding in agriculture as well as attempts to um, provide additional protection to farm workers as you um, have brought up with uh, extending overtime and other protections to farm workers. So taking off the sort of more critical macro level kinds of, kinds of questions, um, the other hat that I wear and many of my colleagues wear is a sort of applied research hat with applied research sort of exploring the role of research and how research can be brought to bear on improving conditions for farm workers and improving the way different programs and initiatives fund. And so applied research can take many different um, forms. And one thing that I've been involved in recently with Ron and with also with Maria is doing, evalu doing evaluation of various certification initiatives, specifically the Equitable Food Initiative. And I see Lillian Otler in the audience. She's one of the trainers for the EFI. Um, and she's been a collaborator with us on that. And so just to, to reiterate what EFI is, it's a uh, market -driven, voluntary market-driven program um, and its uh, main three goals are to ensure um, improved working conditions on farms, improve pes pesticide management and pesticide safety on farms, and to um, increase food safety records for farms. And so growers who sign up for this have to pass an audit and adhere to a number of different standards. And so what we've been doing is evaluating this sort of how this has been working at a very exploratory level, focused on two main things. First of all, what are the costs and benefits to both growers and farm workers of participating in EFI? And then secondly, we've been looking specifically at what are called leadership teams. EFI, EFI calls them leadership teams. Some of the farms call them um, collaboration teams. 
Um, and they're basically teams that are comprised of both workers and managers, and they meet about once a month to do conflict resolution, problem solving, and basically to try to ensure the integrity of the label. And so I don't have time to really go into all of our findings, but um, overall, we've we're pretty impressed with the way these leadership teams are working on the five farms that we visited. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that more later. But I do wanna sort of end with the caveat that as promising as all these different labels are and sort of ensuring better working conditions or better environmental conditions, et cetera, that evidence really shows that these are not a substitute for um, regulation, for enforcement, for um, progressive and just and fair immigration policy for um, public programs providing social services for farm worker communities. And instead we can really see these sorts of um, initiatives as really positive, but not as a substitute for these other types of approaches that we've heard from today. And I would just say, especially in the era of Trump, it's really important that we as professionals or researchers or individuals or consumers aren't just really voting with our dollars, but are also really engaging in the political process to make sure that um, we are doing our part to mitigate the effects of really problematic federal policies right now. And um, I do think it's encouraging that California is sort of leading the way in some really good state, state policy as well. So with that, I will uh, turn it back to Maria. Thank you, Christy. So I want to uh, engage the panel with a, a couple of questions, but I want to draw from the presentations if you, and also, uh, if you want a question, uh, Rosalie is walking around, take a sheet of paper, ask questions, we'll collect them. Um, one thing is, uh, one of the reasons I certainly got involved in this issue beyond background was this connection between sustainable and organic and worker conditions was not always connected. And it, this came to, um, certainly my attention as uh, a mother of young children buying organic milk at a hefty premium, right, if you've gone in the, and not knowing, well, what, what are the conditions of the dairy workers, right? You're paying two, two and a half dollars, sometimes more than a, a regular gallon of milk, and you have no idea how the workers are being treated. So that, that question of how this this market, and as um, Chad said, organic has really exploded. Both Walmart and Costco and others are really seeing that as consumers want organic, so we're trying to put the issue of workers in that debate. The second is the issue of food safety, right? One of the things over the years that we've learned in the agriculture and farm worker perspective is that consumers care very much about what they put in their mouths, and they don't want to get sick. It's a little bit harder to get consumers to think about, well, what about the pesticides that are being used and the exposure that workers have to those pesticides, right? And so again, that slight disconnect between what we purchase and actually thinking about the people and the conditions that produce that food for us, right? So, and the third thing that comes out of this is for some of us who have been around a little while is these issues, whether it was um, the Moreau, what was it called, uh, the TV production in the 19th, Harvest of Shame. Uh, this, these issues have been with us for decades, if not centuries, right? And so we have now the role of the market. So as we sit here today, let me start off with uh, Supervisor Alejo. Um, what, what would you imagine would have to, like the most critical thing that you would suggest that could be a game changer, say, over the next 10 years to really, let's just put my own biases, bring the dignity of workers to, to the forefront? Right. Well, first of all, those who have studied social movements, the civil rights movement, I think um, it, social change doesn't happen from those in high positions in the legislature or in the governorship. Many of those ideas came from the grassroots. And, and uh, the grassroots is coupled when there's places that are doing the research, it informs policy making. 
Uh, you do need those people that go fight in the courts as well as we we're talking about earlier. Those battles in the legal realm are important. But also when you have good ideas backed by good evidence and research, it helps inform policymakers and you're able to make an idea or a goal and into an actual reality. And that's what we're seeing with the uh, governor who's open-minded, with the legislature who's open-minded, and, uh, and, and uh, consumers uh, who are demanding different changes out in what they want to purchase, what they want is the condition they want to see out in the field. It's really making a difference in California in terms of public policy than ever before. And when you, when you look at farm worker issues, I always like to say, it's not just what you, the conditions you talk about in the field or about consumer choices and what they want to see. When you talk about the whole of the farm worker, you talk about their living conditions. And, and for a long time, the only place that had farm worker housing was Napa, where they would tax an acre of, of, of wine acres, and they had three, cent, three centers, 60 workers, 180 workers, but there's a greater need, for, certainly, of that in Napa Valley. But now you have Tana Maranato and Salinas Valley. They did the first fully privately funded farm worker housing, 800 places for farm workers to live. It's a model in the state, and guess what? As a result of that win, and, get, and able to get that through the zoning process because there was some pushback. Now we have five other companies that want to do farm worker housing in the Salinas Valley alone, privately funded, fully funded through private dollars. We didn't see that. On the healthcare side, you talk about the healthcare farm workers. I talked about counties doing efforts, but in the legislature, as the chair of the Latino Caucus, for the first time, we extended healthcare to children all children in California, regardless of their immigration status, 170,000 more kids that are covered by Medi-Cal because the research in the healthcare realm informed the policymakers about make it cost feasible, but also be able to convince the governor that this was the right time to do it. So there's a lot of good examples where we've been able to look at a wide range of, of issues that impact the lives of everyday farm workers in a lot of different realms, but it's the research, it's the advocacy, the grassroots that have really made a tremendous difference, and now we're doing things that have never been done in the history of California. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I want to turn to, um, to Chad. Um, you talked about food safety as sort of the initial kind of really pushing, but can you speak a little more to what role, if any, consumer interest played, or was it, or um, the, the, what moved beyond the initial food safety as being a primary concern? Mm. Yeah, um, I, I think f for us, um, you know, customers do respond, and, and our consumers and our members are looking for uh, things beyond just obviously buying food that's safe to eat. And there is concern about you know, how those workers are being treated. And I think there is a, when we started implementing our social audit policy, it was many, many years uh, before it kind of started coming out in the press. And so we felt that it was important internally as part of our culture to do that. Um, but over time, uh, customers absolutely respond to those things. And I think that's something they're looking for. Uh, you know, fair trade, USA, fair trade, international, and, and those, the, um, the call outs on packages are something that customers respond to. I get direct questions all the time from our customers and members asking about where things are coming from. They want to know what the source of their food is coming from. And that's something probably over the last five to eight years that I've seen much, much more response from the public looking for more information on where their food is coming from, uh, much more than in the past. Um, and because of that, I think that's our, I mean, my role and my responsibility as a buyer is to figure those things out. Um, so it's, it stemmed initially as an internal thing that we wanted to get behind and just do because we thought it was something worth looking into. And that's, like I said, something I think that we wanted to be involved in. But over the years, there's absolutely uh, more people want to know where their food's coming from. And when we have to be able to explain that, I think. So. Thank you. Um, before, uh, any more questions as we gather them up? Um, I want to go to Millie, because one of the issues in this moment where uh, immigration enforcement is definitely putting a chill in so many immigrant communities, uh, one of the uh, little known uh, struggles that farm worker women uh, had to deal with, on, on little known until recently, was the issue of sexual harassment that uh, there have been a number of tele uh, documentary and news stories, but how do you work with women to, to get them to open up and know their rights and be able to have strength to counter the kind of in sexual harassment that can be out in the fields? Wow, it's, it hasn't been an easy task to right. start with. Um, uh, understanding, I mean, just so that people know, 
I'm an organizer. I started as a teenager being uh, an organizer with a union, the UFW. Um, around that time, I was being sexually harassed, but that was a, a topic you don't talk about. There's too many taboos in our, in our families, in our communities. So uh, that's, that's kind of a challenge and a barrier um, that we have to deal with most of the time still. Um, so if it took me 20 years to start talking about it, it's much, it's much harder for, for, for people that really don't uh, know about resources or understand about um, how the law or government works, or if they see the media, how uh, there's not, re you know, the government is not that receptive, et cetera. So what we have, what we have done is it has taken us a long, long, long haul. Uh, even though we started in the late 80s to talk about the different issues um, it, we, because of uh, the different layers of exploitation that ha happens with our, within our community, in, in either within home or, or at work, in society, et cetera, um, we had to learn that uh, little by little started talking about some of them. Of course, the teatro is one of them, other, other art uh, work that we use, um, uh, talking at home, with uh, people in, in um, um, especially, you know, we, we say it, we talk in the, at the kitchen uh, uh, about our issues, but um, we also learned that we needed to, as members uh, or women wanted to join what we were doing, mainly because they were finding out that they, 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 there was more for them to learn and more for them to be able to do. Um, and that um, they're finding out that we have less limits than we were told. It's much easier for us to start talking about that. So um, it has, as I said, it has not been easy because of the taboos. It has not been easy because of the myths that exist and because of the, uh, the information media most of the time has not been very helpful. Um, uh, a lot more times uh, we have to have done some studies ourselves. Um, Southern Poverty Law Center in uh, uh, 2010 uh, did a study with, um, it's called Injustice in Our Plates, and that, that's, that uh, documentary that came out was based on interviewing uh, pharmacal women, immigrant women, uh, throughout the United States. I, myself, was an interviewer, and we interviewed um, 150 women. And most of what came out is uh, that um, nine out of 10 women have been sexually, in terms of harassment, nine out of 10 women have been sexually harassed at least once in the workplace. Um, that's, that's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. I myself was, uh, during the, the time I worked in the fields, I was sexually harassed several times in different companies, and I was working along my brothers, and I was working along with, next to my dad, and I was working when I was working with my husband. And the, it was happening. And it, it's an issue where I was lucky because I was working along these people uh, that I was not raped. But many women don't have that opportunity where they, they work along their, their, their family members. But, um, so it's much harder for them to really know that there's kind of support. And what we end up doing is, OK, let's, let's through the theater, we, we talk about the issue. But at the same time, um, we don't pressure people to start talking because we, we learn that um, working within the cultural context of how people live, it's and their beliefs or their customs. Their, um, it's it's a, a better way to to get people to trust that what we're doing is is going to make a difference. So um, um, we have been involved with the Violence Against Women Act, start, starting in the late '90s. When we learned about that. We got involved and we pushed for better, better regulation. We're talking about pharmacal women saying, this is what's going on. Our testimonies are these. It's not working with us. The same thing with the worker protection standards. We did the same thing. We, you want testimonies? We get those testimonies because we have built that trust. So you, that ability to put a human face to 
the studies to That's have right. that, whether it's worker protections or sexual harassment, is a, is a very good example of That's how critical that is to, right. to making change. That's right. all this, Christine, all the studies in the world, somehow the facts, especially, especially today, the facts don't seem to matter as much, right? But <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah. Right, we have alternative facts. No, never mind. Um, but me a minute to follow you. But um, you spoke earlier, Christy, uh, and I think it's an, an important point because to the, there are many who think that um, the free market takes care of all ills right. and can solve all problems. Mm -hmm. And you made the point in your presentation that even though there is now some beginnings to be some credible data and evidence that consumers are using the market, the power of the consumer, that that alone, in your view, is, is uh, insufficient to make all the changes. So could you just take a minute and say, what makes you say that? Um. I think that, well, for one thing, a lot of these market-based initiatives are really voluntary in nature, and they're not, they're really, to, to some extent, attracting the good actors, and there's still a lot of bad actors out there that are not going to be participating in these kinds of market-led initiatives. That said, I think there is a really strong role for the supply chain to put pressure on farmers. I know in the case of Costco, and the success, the initial success of the Equitable Food Initiative is because retailers and wholesalers like Costco were saying to their growers, this is important to us, we want you on board, and kind of sort of putting pressure on the growers to get on board with these kinds of programs. So there is definitely a role for market actors to kind of put pressure on growers to improve working conditions. That said, again, it's still a voluntary program, and there's only there's only so far those programs can go in affecting change. Um, that said, mark, having market leaders leading the way with these kinds of sustainable, socially progressive practices is really great, but um, it's not gonna it's not gonna change the practices of everybody, and we still need to have really strong regulations and enforcement. And that's one of the real problems is California can have the greatest regulations on the books. But if we're not out there enforcing things like pesticide safety laws, then you know what does that really mean? Right. Um, and so it's exciting to see you know to visit these farms where there's been real cultural shift in sort of how management happens on the farm. It's more participatory, and farm workers have a voice. And we found that on a lot of these farms, you know, sexual harassment is really a very very small, if any, problem at all. And so there are some really great examples out there, but um, this is not necessarily reflective of the entire industry. So, yeah. Right. Well, thank you. Let, we've got some questions here. Um, let's begin with, uh, I'm going to ask to get as many questions answered for, for responses to be, you know, crisp. Um, so, uh, to, it's pardon? It's hard. <laughs> I know, these issues are complicated. But yeah. um, to um, Supervisor Alejo, how big an influence do you think the ag industry has uh, at the state level on California lawmakers? Um, it, it's a good question because I was there for six years able to see who are the voices. At one point when I was a child and my grandfather was one of the early members of the United Farm Workers in 1970, you saw the old reels and the old photos at the Capitol trying to fight for some of the earliest laws to protect farm workers. That was a time when they didn't have laws regarding just having bathroom and clean drinking water out in the field. Things that are the standard today and you think you take them for granted. I go, those were all hard fought battles many years ago and now we're doing even more. Um, but like everything, in Sacramento there's interest groups for every industry, every profession you, you could imagine. Certainly agriculture is, um, is very strong. There's lesser, of course, uh, voices representing farm workers and the poor in Sacramento, but it's growing. Uh, fortunately, there's some growing voices there that, that are important, and there's groups that are grassroots that bring workers to come speak in policy committees and appropriations committees uh, to do rallies outside the Capitol. I I'm glad that there's those voices that bring in um, the people who often don't have a voice in Sacramento. But I think so, on some issues, there is areas for agreement. Um, for example, in, back in, in Salinas just last Monday, we had the first visit um, by the California Attorney General, Javier Becerra, who was, play, who was appointed by Governor Brown to defend against the policies coming from President Trump. Um, one of those being 
the anti-immigrant positions. And so he came to East Orleans to speak to farm workers. But, but in that event, it wasn't just the churches or the labor unions or um, the immigrant advocacy groups. It was nice that it was also the, the um, Grower Shipper Association, the California Strawberry Commission, and the Monterey County Farm Bureau, uh, who said, those are our workers too. And it was a collaborative effort. So on some of those issues on immigration, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of areas of agreement. I think that, that, there's, uh, that you didn't see uh, several years ago. And I think that there needs to be um, an area to build more upon that. And there's some trends that are changing. Um, many people don't know that in the strawberry industry, 65% of the farmers now are Latino farmers. 65%, it's one of the few crops where you've seen a dramatic change. They're not just the workers anymore, now they're the farmers who are having to do all the logistics of farming in a very complicated and regulatory um, area, such as agriculture in California. And so you do see some changes there. But I also wanted to mention that there's some great challenges that you're seeing with it. There is a severe labor shortage. Um, as a result of that, you're seeing farmers who are now having to go and try to get more H-2A guest workers to come in. And that, that creates housing challenges because the federal law requires them to also provide housing to those workers that they're bringing from outside of California. Um, uh, certainly labor costs have gone up, wages have gone up as a result of the labor shortage. Um, but also, yesterday we just had an ag tech conference in Salinas. And when, ag tech means a lot of things, but a big part of ag technology, which is great, you know, uh, we always want to think about high tech and ag tech, but a lot of the, what we talk about ag tech, what you're seeing is mechanization to replace people. Because of the labor shortage, labor shortage is forcing companies to try to find efficiencies, and unfortunately, for some, it's going to mean in some industries it's going to be replaced by mechanization. And um, what does that mean? There's a question. What does that mean to the families uh, as well um, here in California? Thank you, and that that's a good segue on the Latino farmers. I want to go to chat on this or anybody else, given that. Um, there are many trends that indicate that uh, the farm, farmer population is, is in fact aging. There is more land consolidation uh, within corporate. Uh, and so how and in what ways uh, is uh, your industry or anyone else wants to speak to it supporting or creating opportunities for farm workers to transition to, to farm management and operation? Is there any work that focuses on land access? Anybody? Um, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, as far as land access, that's a kind of a tough one for us. I don't think we're directly involved in that. One of the things that we are looking at um, is in terms of looking at conventional farms that are looking to go organic or us encouraging farms to uh, get USDA organic certification. I, for the people who don't know, if to go to USDA certified organic, you, there's a three-year waiting process for that land to be certified. And obviously in that time, those the farmers are not getting paid uh, any kind of premium to do that. So they're having to sell uh, basically organic standardized food at conventional prices. So it's a challenge for farm workers and I'm sorry, for farmers to uh, become USDA certified. And we're struggling as, as our uh, the, the demand is outpacing uh, supply. And so because of that, we're having to go international and go abroad more and more to find raw material and to find goods to support organic. So within the United States, um, we're looking at, and we, we haven't found exactly how we want to do it, but we're looking at figuring out how to pay premiums uh, to farmers to transition because that three-year gap waiting period, um, we're trying to figure out, can we pay a premium to them to help them offset some of their costs so that we can help get that supply down the road? So those are kind of programs that we're talking about internally. Um, I wouldn't say there's a standardized protocol for that yet, but those are all things that we're looking at. And then um, uh, beyond just the USDA organic piece, I think there's a lot of room that could be, you know, work that could be done there. Because as a buyer, I'm, I'm running out of supply all the time on goods that I would buy um, domestically that now I'm going abroad, I'm having to source internationally. There's just not enough ma uh, raw material here. And with consolidation, um, you know, variety is getting cut down, and that's a real problem. So those are things that I do uh, work on. It's um, it's not an easy solution either. I'll say Thank that. you, actually, uh, Millie. Um, if you have an answer, or, or maybe uh, Christine, you might have. Um, to what extent do you find working conditions to be different or better on or California organic farms versus conventional farms? Is there a difference? Well, it, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's hard uh, to answer that because um, uh, what we have found that um, uh, harassment happens everywhere. And um, 
the maybe there might not be pesticides, but there might be other kind of uh, conditions. Um, uh, if uh, uh, there the if there's a, a good intent by the by the either small farmer or, or large farmer that is or an organic farmer thinking that that's that's a better way to for consumers you know just have a, a better environment maybe is not looking at the what we call the green jobs uh, where um, they they might not be looking in terms of um, understanding who if it's a large farm if if they have their crew leaders that are well prepared and really truly understand uh, that the health and safety of workers is also important, it's not just um, quote unquote an organic product. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there, there, we we have found some <laughs> that are that are not uh, uh, good equipped in terms of uh, having uh, good conditions. So often it becomes down to. You know, you can have the regulations, you can have the, the, the buyer, if you will, wanting certain, but it comes down to the individuals, right? The mayordomos, the, the, the leadership that's provided. I mean, we just saw the story on Wells Fargo and the clawback that started with man, right? So the question is, what can be done to better regulate uh, labor contractors who are a big part of, of supplying the labor? Uh, to to ag in California and uh, anyone want to speak to that what can be done about improving the quality the knowledge the commitment to the values you've talked about um, I think I, I'd like for us to get to talk a little bit about that and that has to do uh -huh. So why don't you stand up and you stand can, up yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so that is uh, the executive director of leaders campesinas yeah. So um, I think it's important um, as it's, you know, the labor force, the farm worker labor force is becoming uh, more uh, the responsibility of um, independent like um, agencies mm -hmm. and then the contractors and then versus the actual farmer. Um, we were talking about the dynamic of the relationship between the farmer you know, prioritizing, you know, as they work with either an agency or the contractor, you know, that, that uh, you know, perhaps in that relationship is where, you know, the laws that are supposed to be enforced get enforced. It's just similarly to the consumers, like, you know, the example that was given about Costco, um, you know, um, the, the contractors and these agencies are suppliers to the, to the farmer. So increasing the, the awareness and, and just the acceptance that these issues exist, on, you know, from the farmer Worker, farm, from the farmer's perspective, and holding these contractors and these ag so agencies that, uh, accountable. In, in essence, saying to the farmer, or trying to educate the farmer to say, right. you can't turn a blind eye. Exactly. You, you, yeah. you have some role in this. That's right. All right, yeah. great, thank you. Um, living in urban areas, um, anyone can take this. How do we connect and contribute to some of the farm worker social movements and policies that are taking place in these rural communities. Uh, is there a way for, what other ways can those who live in urban areas support um, these issues um, that don't even come to the cities, whether it's rural housing, right, zoning, you know, here in Berkeley, I mean, we have our own, not in my, what's it called, NIMBY, not in my background or backyard. Um, we have these issues, so what, what can, those of us who care about these issues contribute to that effort. I mean, I think particularly now a lot of the, um, you know, the issues going on with ICE and immigration issues, um, a lot of those, you know, the deportation rates, those are happening in urban areas and rural areas. So I think that in some ways some of the issues that are most salient right now cut across the urban-rural divide, I would say. So the more we can sort of resist and support the sanctuary city movement and um, you know support our local communities I think it's all interconnected so um, I think there's a lot of ways right now that even acting locally is sort of supporting the bigger picture of um, all of our immigrant communities and, and I, I would say yeah. that also public opinion really does matter yeah. they, uh, they do polls on different issues and when you're in Sacramento and, and you, you, you got a piece of legislation that pulls very badly among everyday hardworking residents of California, 
it, it, it gets paid attention to. But on some issues, such as immigration reform, you have now like between 70 80% of Californians said we need to find a, a logical a solution to comprehensive immigration reform. On driver's license, where the majority of Californians were against it, now the majority of Californians say it's the right thing to do as long as they have to do the same requirements just like everyone else. So that's where people such as yourselves have played a big role in the public opinion realm that, that allowed um, to have, for legislators to have more courage to support certain pieces of legislation that just 10 or 20 years ago were impossible to pass here in our state. So if there's been one major thing that has really changed and allowed us and, and our current governor to pass some laws that really helped the lives of farm workers, it's been people um, just as all, all your, like yourselves that have really made that possible and uh, made it palpable for voters, uh, for legislators to have the courage to do what is right and pass laws that really do have an impact on, on farm workers. I do want to just touch about, because um, I, I always believe, because um, we live in rural areas, and I like to encourage our young, our young people in our communities that there's a lot of great jobs in agriculture, and many of us grew up as children and grandchildren of farm workers, but agriculture is very sophisticated today. Um, and, and when it comes to marketing, when it comes to food safety, when it comes to research and some of the labs that you see back home, I like to encourage our young people to not only be the children of farm workers, but to be the farmers themselves and be the people doing the research and the marketing and doing the ag tech. I like to encourage that in rural areas, that's gonna continue to be one of the main sources of jobs and the backbone of some of our economies. So, so we have to also break out and, uh, and encourage our young people that there's some great professions, some great jobs to do, and we need good people in all areas, and who better than young people who, who whose parents and grandparents were farm workers now leading the agricultural industry and, and leading some of the laws that we need to make sure that are, that are being enforced and protected. We need people in those areas too. And I think by encouraging that, we're gonna see, uh, continue to see good, good changes happen in rural areas and in the agricultural industry. Great, thank you. Um, Chad, what kind of data do you have access to in your social audits, at Ray, worker conditions and rights, and how do you know it's credible? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question, because I think at the end of the day, we're never 100% sure that everything we're doing and buying from it is perfect. Most of those audits are done once a year. There's surprise spot audits that are done you know, randomly throughout the year, but um, a lot of those audits, yeah, they, they're certifying that something is looking great on a specific day. And sometimes they're announced, sometimes they're not announced, but sometimes uh, you know, we're not 100% sure. But um, the one thing that we rely on is that the third party, they're outside uh, companies that are doing this, so they're not uh, ran by Costco or by the vendor that we're looking at. So we try to rely on third party as um, that's who's doing the work. So we, we're trusting that they're, um, they're doing their due diligence, um, and these are groups and people that are doing audits um, are certified. Uh, and, and I guess there's, at the end of the day, there's really just a trust factor that those things are happening on a daily basis outside of that. Um, but they're very thorough on going through uh, what they're seeing in the conditions on any given day, as much as record keeping as well. There's very sophisticated amounts of records that have to be kept. Um, and there's also spot interviews. We interview people, those third parties interview workers all the time, pull them aside. Um, and of course, you know, you don't know exactly what those answers are if, you know, if they're, depends on how forthcoming they feel they can be. So, um, you know, I guess I feel like we put forth a lot of effort, but at the end of the day, are we 100% sure that everything is perfect? Absolutely not. There's, there's a long way to go, uh, both with all the suppliers that we work with and for our side and being educated as well. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, there's a certain trust factor that mm -hmm. those things are happening, but, you know. Um, and I, I think it would... That's true with almost anything, right? I mean, I, I'm thinking of the Volkswagen diesel, you know, the mile, I mean, yeah. Yeah. there are trust factors, uh -huh. right? Um, yeah. So uh, one last question. Um, we've talked about the market, um, and I think, Christy, you talked about the limitations on the market-based. But it is 2017, and as we set the context, these issues have been with us for so long. Um, is there something, I mean, it, what else can be done? Is, sometimes it feels like we just, over the years, just never really value agriculture or the work that, go, the manual labor that goes into we don't value work anymore. I don't mean to be philosophical, but sometimes it feels like that. Uh, and yet, obviously, food is essential to every human being. So EFI limitations, 
Next big idea. And I don't mean to put you on the spot. That's Anybody else can answer. That's a question of the, of the year. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I certainly don't have the answer on how to, to change our food system. I mean, certainly in other, you know, one of the real problems with the U.S. food system is it's really based on a philosophy of cheap food. And, you know, you can, it's hard to just blame the farmers for not paying the growers enough when everybody's getting squeezed by a system in which there's seemingly some sort of finite price point. Um, and, you know, we can look to other countries in Europe. It's not, it's, there seems to be more um, sort of value placed on food and it's not quite the same kind of model. So maybe more comparative work to sort of understand how things might shift, but how that is operationalized in practice, I, I certainly don't have the answers. I think, I think addressing these challenges from all of these different approaches is really the way to go. Focus on the market, focus more on grassroots mobilization, let's reinvigorate the farm worker movement, let's make sure we have the right legislation um, on the books, let's support um, worker-based social rights initiatives and human rights initiatives. So. Um, Beyond that, I don't really no. I think, don't really I have think, the answers. <laughs> well, I think it goes to. Um, um, does anybody else yeah. want? To? What I, I would say, what can we as individuals do? Yeah. And plus, what as as legislators and and, and uh, our government, what can we do? But as consumers, all of us, like when when new legislators would come to Sacramento, I'd always tell the farm worker and the agriculture groups, go go. Um, reach out to that urban legislator who came from LA or San Diego or the Bay Area who, who their knowledge of agriculture um, came to the grocery store, right, when they were buying something. But for all of us, even people who grew up in rural areas and, and came from farm worker families, there's still a lot that we can learn. And so I always think it's very powerful when, as consumers, we make that effort to find out about agriculture. There's a lot of, uh, of tours now, visiting farmers. I go, if anybody could go and, and, and work for a few minutes, work for an hour, and, and experience what a farm worker goes through hours and hours in a day, you would walk away very impressed. You would find out, one, that it's not unskilled labor, it's very skilled labor. Whether you're a, a worker who picks wine grapes, or you pick strawberries, just go try it yourself and you will see how sophisticated, how hard it is to do, and you will walk away. And every time you drive by a rural area and you see all those workers in the field, you will feel a sense of pride and respect because you put yourself in their shoes just for a few minutes and you, it will change you forever. Um, on the legislative side, I think there was some outside the box thinking because I did my trips to Washington. I was trying to lobby even the Republican congressional members like Kevin McCarthy from Bakersfield. I did all those sit downs, but we didn't pass anything. So when Obama, the administration was still in, we in California were trying to pass a first of its kind pilot program. We needed to ask the, the federal agencies, give us authority in California. So if you guys are not gonna do nothing in Washington, give California the authority to do a pilot program for agricultural workers where we could give work permits. They would be renewable every three years, but um, they'd have to you know, meet, meet some certain requirements, uh, prove residencies, this wasn't workers coming from the outside. People already here, that they would have a way to work lawfully and pay their taxes. That that was an outside the box thinking here in California. It got held up in Sacramento even, but these are the new ideas that we're trying to find. What ways can we improve farm workers, the lives of farm workers? That was an additional idea that's still out there, that still could be done. Uh, like, and as I said, the work isn't over yet on what we could do here in our state's capital to keep pushing the envelope. That's a great, thank you. Um, and then along those lines, um, for consumers, how do we how do we reframe food purchasing uh, in ways that elicits both uh, equal interest and nutritional value? Right, we we have a big challenge. Of the BFI is uh, multidisciplinary, includes the school of public health. Right, it's issues we're very concerned about the impact of food choice. Um, so there's greater awareness of the importance of nutritional value and also interest in how those harvesting the food are treated. How, how do we make that connection? It kind of goes back to the organic question, right? As we build up the market demand for organic, it may be, it may be supervisor, it may be Luis's idea about maybe we should have people go spend an hour on a hot sun picking strawberries. <laughs> You'll appreciate the strawberries a lot more, I guarantee you. Anyone? I need an optimistic note here. <laughs> well, I'll, well, I will speak, just getting back to the equitable food initiative, I mean, the way that EFI has really linked food safety and farm working conditions is really strategic because consumers are really worried about the, whether or not their food is safe. 
right? And so the, the EFI label is responsibly grown farm worker assured. And the idea is that farm workers who are treated well, who are um, sort of respected and trained to follow the food safety protocols and agricultural practices, um, you know, so that, I, so that linkage, I think, is a smart linkage because it really shows that, to, you know, the, the, sort of the link is that it's not just sort of benevolence that we care about farm workers, but farm workers who are treated well and are working under good condition are going to ensure, hopefully, that our food is safer. So maybe that's sort of, so maybe we just need to think more strategically about how we make those connections because, you know, surveys of consumers have shown that, you know, animal rights are much more important than farm worker rights. So, you know, as we do the education, in the meantime, let's think strategically about other angles as well. Uh, and, and to that point, I think that the importance of workers actually um, connecting to, to safety is also in the work that Saru Chamayan, I can never say her name, but she's a colleague at the Goldman School of Public Policy who uh, uh, has worked in the food, food worker chain, Food Chain Worker Alliance. Um, but one of the issues she makes, she does a lot of work on restaurant workers and the importance of not having a sick leave policy means the person serving you the food may be coming in with a cold or a flu or something contagious. And so that is a way of connecting that worker rights actually also impact your potentially your own health. So it's not some benevolent. It's actually in the interest of the community, of a city, of a company. Um, and I think that those are parallels that, that can be drawn. Um, that kind of wraps it up here. I, I hope that you have um, taken something from this very different perspectives on these issues on, on farm labor, on the issue of production of food. Um, uh, we really want to invite you to look at our website, the Berkeley Food Institute, um, because there are this food, the issue of farm workers is one of the priority areas, but there is other work that we are doing as well. And um, I would like to just ask you all to give a, a round of a pardon. Quick close. Oh yeah. Oh. Absolutely, I should have been. A quick close. Yeah, quick close. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming and taking an interest in issues impacting a lot of my constituents. But many of us came out of farm worker families. Many of our grandparents, when they came to this country, my, mine came during the Bracero program, which was a guest worker program from the 40s to the 60s. My grandfather only went to the third grade, and my grandmother never went to school in Mexico. But two generations later, I was able to come to great universities like UC Berkeley, go to law school, go to graduate school, became a lawyer to represent farm workers, and later became a legislator. So many of us very, feel very privileged that we have a responsibility to share our stories, to uh, keep um, advancing progress in terms of the lives of farm workers and their children, the families as a whole. But you can't do that without people all across the state of California also believing in that, believing in that work. And so before I ended, I, I did bring about 30, uh, you know, I was, I was author of the California driver's license bill. We made these posters, so I brought 30 of them. Uh, I know, there's, I thought it was gonna be a smaller crowd, but I brought 30, so please take one. Um, Shane over here, my, my staff has them, but it's a, it was a collector's, this is when the governor signed that, that landmark law in Los Angeles and in a separate press conference in Fresno. We gave these out to farm workers and to the community to um, mark a moment, a historic moment in California in history, we're doing a law that's really made a tremendous difference. Imagine just a license, just to get to work and to come home at night every night without fear. You're going to get jailed, and in many cases, people who didn't have identification uh, would get sent to the jail and under the security community's policies, they would even deport and separate for their families for not having something so basic as a driver's license. So this one I wanted to give to Maria Escheveste because Maria not only worked for the Clinton administration in Washington, but during her time there, she was also a representative for farm workers, California Rural Legal Assistance, that when we didn't have, they couldn't even afford somebody to represent them in, in our nation's capital, Maria did that work. So I want to present yeah. this to her okay. for her work. You know. <laughs> Just, um, just want to uh, bring about, when you're talking about uh, trying to get to consumers, um, it's important to also remember, all of us, remember that uh, our communities are also consumers. And uh, we've been working on projects that deal with uh, the, the dollar stores. 
And uh, part of what we have been finding out is that dollar stores are in many of the communities where there's poor people. And it's not just farm workers, it's poor people in general. And if you're talking about wanting to get information from consumers a lot more times, because we don't have um, the luxury, because we, we see it as a luxury of, of the time to be able to, um, to think about how, how, how healthy is our food, because we at least want to get food in our table because we don't earn enough money, then a lot of the products we're finding out that are being sold in, our, in, our, in these communities are products that are not healthy. And in different ways, uh, this is why we also got engaged. And so it's, it's uh, where this kind of society is not necessarily part of the general community where you would find answers about you know, in what way are we gonna get good and healthy food. So I just wanted to bring that up. And, and I really thank, um, thank you all for, for uh, listening to um, uh, us that are, are, are in communities that the majority of the time um, uh, uh, communities feel that there, there might not be um, uh, you know, um, a future uh, but at the same time, some of us do see that there are, is future, but then get, get involved with other or organizations or, or networking with, with different, um, different stakeholders. And, and learning that, is, it, it's a, a lot more of a difference. Um, I really thank you all, and I really thank the women, especially the women from Líderes Campesinas, because they've come a long ways. Many of them uh, did not go to work today because they wanted to be here to express. Earlier we did uh, have conversation with students, and uh, right now we're here to, to give. Um, as, and, and they're gonna be out there at the reception uh, wanting to respond uh, or to talk to you. They, they're here for that. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. Chad, Christy, any closing? Uh, no, just really thank you to everybody and um, to everybody's points here. Ask questions. You know, you're, you're all consumers. I'm a consumer. Ask questions. Retailers you're buying from, brands you like, write them, email them, ask questions because the food world is not a clear world and the connections are very, they're not transparent at all. So um, if you're interested, ask questions and um, it's really pressure from the public asking those types of questions that are gonna make change happen. Um, and I mean, I, I do that and you see some pretty interesting things behind the scenes, let me tell you. Uh, and you might not get answers to all your questions, but, but definitely ask, it's the best thing everybody can do to make change happen, so thank you. Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Anthrop to, to close up. Thank you so much. Thank you to Maria. Can we have one more round of yeah. applause for Maria and all our panelists? And also, again, muchas gracias, muchísimas gracias a las uh, líderes campesinas por tu teatro al inicio. Thank you so much for the líderes. And, and all to you, all of you for coming. I also, before we uh, closed for reception, I want to express our appreciation to my colleagues from the Berkeley Food Institute, Rosalie Fanchel in particular, and, and also Louis, Louisa Brown um, and Julia Tuber, who I think is still here, and uh, Nina Ichikawa. Also, our faculty co-director is here this evening, um, Claire Kremen, so we're really pleased for our BFI team. Um, and also, we appreciate the co-sponsorship of the School of Public Health and the Pesticide Action Network, who are also represented at this event today. So thank you for helping us in the outreach. Um, I do also want to mention that, uh, and Maria alluded to this in the beginning, that one of BFI, the Berkeley Food Institute's priorities, is in fact addressing farm worker um, health and rights, and more broadly, promoting fair and healthy food uh, jobs in food systems. So this is a really important issue to us, and we are expanding our program work focused on these important issues through our research and through our educational activities, through our policy and our community engagement work. Um, at the same time, we're also doing increasing collaboration and partnership with organizations like the ones represented here that are working on these issues. So, um, you know, we really feel the importance of this, of this issue, and particularly in this moment. And um, so please check out our website to see, uh, and our, our social media, 
um, get onto our newsletter so you can learn more about what we're doing in this and in many other areas of food systems change. So um, we'd like to keep in touch with all of you. Um, we now invite you to enjoy food and beverages on our the patio. The patio outside, it's a little chilly, but hopefully we can keep warm by conversation and um, you'll have an opportunity to talk to all the panelists. So um, we have a special caterer um, named uh, from Alma, from El Michiote, and she's a participant in the La Cocina Incubator Program. So she's the caterer this evening, so we can enjoy that food. So thank you again to everybody for being here and to our panelists, and enjoy the evening. Thanks.